Happy holidays, strange thinkers. Remember, all holidays matter. So, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Merry Festivus, Happy Kwanzaa, get your Saturnalia on, or however your holy day self identifies. Today, I'm gonna go over some of the books I use for my videos and articles, and explain why you need these books in your life. You can find links for all of the books described in the description below. Please check it out, it will help the channel, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Before we get started, <laughs> that subscribe button, click a bell, like the video, send nudes, so you can stay up to date on all the new content coming out. All right, we got Lord Ganesha here to help us out. We have a hammer. Uh, we all know what we're gonna use this for. I have a lantern that only kind of works. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, Here's some pliers I found. I don't really know what I would use them for, but who cares? We'll figure it out. Let's get into this. The Complete Works of Aristotle by Aristotle. Aristotle is probably one of the most famous and influential philosophers in Western philosophy. Uh, he was a student of Plato, a teacher of Alexander the Great. He taught at the Lyceum in Athens. These are the complete editions, the Jonathan Barnes translations. I would get these if you know you want to study philosophy rigorously, um, especially if your interest is in ancient Western philosophy or medieval scholastic philosophy. Um, so, according to legend, the books that make up the complete works are only one part of all of Aristotle's teachings. These are the esoteric teachings. Uh, what he taught personally to his students in private. Like Plato, Aristotle did write in dialogues, but unfortunately none of these have survived to the current times. I'm still upset about the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> so many people complain about the difficulty of reading these texts, and that's for two reasons. One, these translated are translated from a very modernist perspective. Uh, this means that many of Aristotle's terms are translated using terms from modernity that didn't really have the same meaning um, as Aristotle would have understood it. Uh, the other, the second reason is legend states. states. He didn't even write these. These are actually notes his students took, which is why sometimes reading Aristotle can feel like a convoluted mess, much like my life. Um, these notes were passed down through generations before being discovered in like a cave or a basement or something. So, all right. So the next book is Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison um, by 20th century French philosopher Michel Foucault. Uh, this is a book where all these Foucault prison memes come from. Uh, this was published in 1975. Uh, Discipline and Punish looks at the creation of disciplinary societies that formed during the Industrial Revolution. Foucault looks at the prison as the ideal system upon which power was applied to individuals, molding them into a certain type of subject. Um, in the case of the prison, a criminal. It's where he talks about the famous panopticon. But Foucault reasoned that these mechanisms of control existed in all forms of life, from the school to the barracks, the hospital to the factory. Um, it's a must read for anyone interested in Foucault or any disciplinary systems. The next book is The Essential Works of Foucault, 1954 to 1984. This is a massive collection of all the articles, essays, um, interviews, book reviews, etc. that he did throughout his life. As the title implies. These selections focus on what Foucault wrote about the concept power, which is really important to Foucault. Uh, he kind of revolutionized the concept by showing how power had more than just a negative effect, but could also have a positive effect. Um, I do have the other two volumes as well. The first one is Ethics, and the second one is Aesthetics, Method, and Epistemology. Um, but I just wanted to focus on the third one because it's my fave. The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, An Introduction by Michel Foucault. Uh, this was published in 1976, so one year after he punished Discipline and Punish. It was about this word sexuality, which only became popular in the 19th century and how people began to understand themselves as individuals with asexuality. This book is a history of the experience of sexuality and how the knowledge about sexuality was connected to different fields of knowledge like 
the hospital, the family, hygiene, race, etc. And was governed by rules and norms about sexuality. To quote Foucault, he says this book was about, quote, the forms within which individuals are able or obliged to recognize themselves as subjects of sexuality. As you can tell, this is volume one and was originally supposed to be the first of six volumes on the subject. Foucault only published three during his death. Oh my god, Foucault again? Yes, again and again and again. Anyway, this is the book, Power, Knowledge, Selected Interviews, and Other Writings from 1972 to 1977 by Michel Foucault. So this is during um, a really intense time for him when he's working on discipline and punish. He's working on the history of sexuality. He's really focusing on these genealogical aspects um, of different institutions. Uh, so on and so forth. And I think this is just another series of essays, but I think most of these are repeated in the power book I mentioned earlier. Um, but a couple articles worth mentioning are questions on geography, which tries to show the way power flows in any type of space, truth and power, which gives Foucault's theory of truth, and an essay entitled The History of Sexuality, which is also a really good read. Final one, I promise. Uh, this is called Society Must Be Defended. Um, this is actually basically a write-out of these lectures that he gave at the Collège de France uh, from 1975 to 76. In this book, he mainly focuses on the concept of sovereignty. Definitely an interesting read. He goes over Hobbes, he goes over Machiavelli a little bit. Um, so I would definitely recommend all these classes because it's... Really interesting to figure out where he starts and then like how he, where he ends up. Cause you end up covering like an enormous amount of ground. So definitely check this book out, especially if you're like a Foucault stan or however y'all self identify. All right, this book, Pull Yourself Together, a true story of alternate reality, spiritual healing and dimensional wholeness by author Rebecca White Cotton. In it, uh, White Cotton describes how there are an infinite amount of realities in the multiverse uh, where different versions of us exist, but they made slightly different choices. Why Cotton describes how she connected across dimensions to a child she never had in this reality. I do plan on doing a full review of this book at some point, but if you're into that type of, uh, you know, new age spirituality stuff, this is definitely a book worth getting into. Difference and Repetition by 20th century French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Um, he published this in... 1969 it was it's his magnum opus um or his greatest work i think he also this was technically his dissertation um but man this book is crazy fucking hard like but it's so fucking good like let me tell you something about the let me tell you something about the loss Woo! love me some delas like you'll get through a chapter and be mentally exhausted but in a good way, like, you got a really good workout. Um, this is super advanced level territory, but worth it if you dive in. The next book that we're going to be looking at is Caliban and the Witch, Woman, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation by philosopher Silvia Federici. Uh, man, let me tell you. Let me tell you something about Silvia Federici! Uh, y'all don't even know. Like, seriously, y'all do not even know. If you think you know something about Rich Hunt, you're wrong period. Uh, Federici destroys any misconceptions about witchcraft and witch hunts. She shows how integral to the formation of capitalism the witch hunts uh, were. This is a must-have. I actually did a short on this book, and I plan on doing individual videos on each chapter of this book, so stay tuned for that, but definitely make sure that you get a copy. So Writers of the Purple Wage is the only fiction book on here. Um, it's a novella written in 1967 by science fiction author Philip Jose Farmer. Um, and it's his favorite story of mine and I've actually read most of his books. It's written in a kind of like Finnegan's Wake style uh, of writing and it seems like every time I read it I end up like discovering something new for instance. Um, it's about a futuristic society where automation has basically made it so that nobody has to work. Instead everyone is given um, a wage at birth, a wage that society says that they automatically have a right to just by being born, i.e. the purple wage. It shows like 
what if that were the case where everyone were just given a wage and they didn't have to do any work what is it that would actually like occur um i love this book check it out so the Tao Te Ching, also pronounced Tao Te Ching, um, is the foundational text in the Chinese philosophy and religion of Taoism. Taoism is dope. Um, the yin yang is its most recognizable symbol, which I got right here. Um, it focuses on the word Tao, a word that really escapes translation or um, any kind of like description and at best can be described as a way in the same way that a trail in the woods is a pathway to follow. This was allegedly uh, written by a person named Lao Tzu. Um, however, the word Lao Tzu simply means old master. Um, for all we know, it was written by a fucking dragon. Um, the earliest text we have of dates to 400 BCE, which is before the Common Era. This was before the Chinese written language was standardized by the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huangdi of the Qin Dynasty. You see, even ancient China was huge. Like, modern China is the equivalent size of, like, the United States of America. So it's a really, really big place. There are hundreds of what are called dialects of the Chinese language that may as well be their own different language to begin with. It wasn't until the first emperor that the Chinese written language was formalized and universalized so that it could apply to any dialect. So say you speak Mandarin and you go meet someone that only speaks Cantonese. While the spoken word for a word like chair will be different between the two speakers, the written word will mean the same for both of them. So they're able to communicate even though they don't speak the same spoken language. Now, most Taoist texts use Use ancient dialects which didn't even use verb tenses so the first sentence of the Tao Te Ching says like the Tao that can be spoken of is not the eternal Tao if you translated this literally from ancient Chinese it would say the Tao that can be Tao is not the eternal Tao at the same time when looking at Taoist texts there are often lines that are just missing so translators sometimes have to just like make up what they think was there so reading different translations of Taoist works are really important in understanding Taoism, which is why I have so many freaking copies. So many copies. I love the Tao Te Ching. So many copies. Um, I will just say real quick the Shamhala, Shambhala, the Shambhala edition, which was translated by John C.H. Wu. I got this when I was... Um, a young lad, uh, age of 13, my uncle, who was at the time into Taoism, gave it to me then. Um, and it's been with me ever since, and um, Taoism is still a really important philosophy for me. The Tao Te Ching, I think I heard somewhere that's actually the third most translated book in the world after the Bible and the Quran. Um, if that's not true, you can flame me in the comments. That's perfectly fine. But that's just what I heard. There's also, I have the Zhuangzi. Uh, which is basically the second most important text in Taoism besides the Tao Te Ching, and was written by somebody allegedly named Zhuangzi. All right, so we, our next book is Conjectures and Refutations, The Growth of Scientific Knowledge by uh, 20th century philosopher Karl Popper. Um, this book was originally published in 1963. It's really long and collects a lot of different essays and courses that Popper taught mainly on epistemology and philosophy of science. This is one of the places that he talks about falsification, uh, which we did a video on. Um, if you're into science, definitely check this out. The next book is The Ecology of Attention by Yves Citon. Uh, this is actually a recent book. It was published in 2014. I did do a short review on this, but basically Citon talks about how we in the advanced industrialized world uh, no longer exist in an economy where there is a scarcity of goods, um, but an economy where there is a scarcity of attention. Um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Grindr, literally every app out there is trying to commodify your attention in order to sell ad space. Um, but because, I assume you, like most of us, are probably puny mortals, your attention is finite. It's a scarce resource. Anyway, this is a great read. Definitely check this out. This is the translated work of Einstein's theory of special and general relativity. One of the things that's really cool about this work is that Einstein actually came up with a number of tests that if refuted would refute the entire theory of general relativity. By the time this book came out in 1920, 
Um, two of those tests had actually confirmed the theory, not falsify it. Special relativity deals with light, photons, where general relativity is about the curvature of space-time caused by massive objects or gravity. Here we have a treatise of human nature by David Hume. Um, this pretty much contains like almost most of his philosophy. Um, it starts out with going over like metaphysics or his skepticism of metaphysics, um, epistemology, but he also gets into things like habits and emotions. Um, and it's a really, really, really long book. Um, if you're looking for more of like a spark notes edition, I would get the inquiry on human understanding. Um, but this is the complete thing. And if you read through this, you should have a pretty good understanding of Hume. Conflict is not abuse. Overstating harm, community responsibility, and the duty to repair by Sarah Schulman. Um, this is another book I did a short book review on and plan on doing a longer video reviewing it because... Oh boy, I've been waiting for someone in the community to bring up this fucking nightmare text. The woman who wrote this book is an actual abusive stalker. It's more of a manual on how to get away with being a piece of shit than anything else. Hey, if you hear someone raining praises upon Conflict is Not Abuse by Sarah Shulman or saying that everyone should read it, it is my sincerest advice that you get the absolute fuck away from them. This shit is clearly in a abuser's manifesto written in lefty language. You're not the problem at all. This abuse apologism straight up. It's fucking vile. Yeah, because of Twitter threads. Um, Shulman describes how we live in a society where we regularly confuse conflict, which is a natural emotion that is just part of the human condition, with abuse, which is a specific harm done to a person. We do this by overstating harm, by confusing conflict with abuse. Um, just because you are in a situation where you feel conflicted does not mean that you are being abused. For Shulman, conflict implies a power struggle, while abuse implies power over or domination over another. She analyzes this through the lens of personal relationships, oppressed peoples with oppressive governments like African Americans in the United States, Palestinians in apartheid Israel, and even the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Definitely a book I recommend reading even if it might make you uncomfortable at some point and challenge your belief systems, because it actually probably will, which I think is a benefit of the book and not necessarily a deficit. So definitely check this out. Nietzsche and Philosophy by Gilles Deleuze. Um, this is Deleuze's book on German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, unlike Difference and Repetition, this is a very clear explanation of Nietzsche's philosophy, and it's probably one of my favorite interpretations of Nietzsche, because I just think he gets it right. Like, it seems to be what Nietzsche actually meant or the various meanings that he meant. I think it's a must read if you want an introduction to Nietzsche or if you're just having trouble understanding Nietzsche. I think that Deleuze does a very good job at um, clearing up a lot of these concepts. Speaking of Nietzsche, we have The Gay Science with a prelude in rhymes and an appendix of songs. Um, the Gay Science is the first book in Friedrich's more mature phase. It was published in 1882. It is where he first mentions the death of God, which we covered in this video. The Gay Science also presents the first description of the eternal recurrence of the same, albeit in a profoundly pessimistic way. Uh, the next book by Friedrich that we're going to look at is The Spake Zarathustra, a book for all but also not. The book is probably Friedrich's most difficult work, but also some of his most beautiful. It was published in parts between 1883 and 1885. Um, it tells of the travels and teachings of a figure named Zarathustra. Um, Nietzsche gets this character from the prophet of Zoroastrianism, also named Zarathustra, but Nietzsche isn't preaching Zoroastrianism, but the philosophy of the future. He talks about the various deaths of God, the will to power, the will zermacht. Uh, the Ubermensch as the next evolution of humanity, the being that overcomes humanity. The eternal recurrence of the same, nihilism, decadence, and so much more. Honestly, you'll probably have to read this book like a hundred times 
even to start understanding it. But that's the fun of reading Nietzsche. I always describe reading Friedrich as being in front of a dam, and the dam breaks over, flooding you with water. That's what reading Nietzsche feels like to me, anyway. I'm not sure why he picked Zarathustra as his main character in this book, so if you know, go ahead and leave it in the comments. The next book by Friedrich is Beyond Good and Evil, a prelude to the philosophy of the future. So I'm just gonna read like the Wikipedia on this. Uh, it says in it, Nietzsche exposes the deficiencies of those usually called philosophers and identifies the quality of the new philosophers, imagination, self-assertion, danger, originality, and the creation of values. He then contests some of the key presuppositions of the old philosophic tradition, like self-consciousness, knowledge, truth, and free will, explaining them as inventions of a moral consciousness. In their place, he offers the Wille to Power as an explanation of all behavior. This ties into his perspective of life, which he regards as beyond good and evil denying a universal morality for all human beings. Religion and the master and slave moralities feature prominently as Nietzsche reevaluates deeply held humanistic beliefs, portraying even domination, appropriation, and injury to the weak as not universally objectionable. Next we have Twilight of the Idols. Twilight of the Idols was written in about a week and published in 1888. Um, if you want an introduction to his philosophy, this is probably the best to start with because this was his purpose for writing it. As he became more popular, both inside Germany and outside Germany, he wanted to create a very short text uh, to kind of give an introduction to his philosophy. Um, this version also has the Antichrist, which he wrote at the same time, but the Antichrist wasn't um, published until much later. It basically goes over all of Christian history and stuff like that it's also a really fascinating read and finally the last book by nietzsche on the genealogy of morality a polemic um if you read nothing else by nietzsche i think this is the one book that you should definitely read it's here that friedrich basically smashes objective morality into teeny tiny pieces uh, he looks at the origins of the terms good and evil master slave morality resentment bad conscious, guilt, ascetic ideals, and the ascetic priests that preach them, and of course, nihilism. Identity and Difference by 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger. Now, I'm a huge Heidegger fan, personally. Um, this specific book contains two lectures. One is called The Principle of Identity, which is about the principle of identity, and the second one is called The Ontotheological Constitution of Metaphysics. Both lectures combined are like 60 pages, so it's a pretty short read. Um, I plan on doing videos on both. The first one I've already recorded and just have to edit now. The other one I still have to write. So buy this book and look for new videos coming out soon on this topic. The Quick Fix Why Fad Psychology Can't Cure Our Social Ills by Jesse Single. Um, this book is great. Jesse Single goes through a lot of pop psychology from the past few decades and shows how it's basically all bullshit. Uh, he talks about the super predator myth, uh, posing and power, implicit bias testing, and more. Definitely pick up, and it's a pretty easy read too. This is the complete works of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. Uh, this is the Hackett edition. If you plan on studying Western philosophy seriously, like as an undergrad or wherever, this is a must. It's still pricey at $50, but it's the complete works. Um, it's shy of like 2,000 pages, uh, and it has that really thin paper that they use for like Bibles and stuff. But it, you know, it has all his works, and as a Alfred White Northhead once said, all of Western civilization is but footnotes to Plato. Hey Dink, why today's media makes us despise each other by Matt Taibbi. Now, I am a super huge fan of Matt Taibbi. Um, he's one of my favorite journalists. I love the way he writes, the way he's able to identify and explain these like very complex yet pivotal structures um, is mind blowing. Um, this book, Hate Inc., is another brilliant work. Its unofficial title is Manufacturing Discontent, a sequel of sorts to philosopher Noam Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent. Um, Taibbi shows how news media has changed in the age of neoliberalism. Back when Taibbi was a young lad, uh, there were like three stations, period. <laughs> so the goal of the news was to reach the broadest possible audience. 
But starting in the 90s, we see a fracturing of audiences. Um, Fox News started this by specifically targeting geriatric people of a colonial complexion. But today, all the news stations do this from Fox to CNN to MSNBC, uh, etc., so on and so forth. Taibi talks about how we've created new spaces that never challenge people's belief, but continuously reinforces their already existing beliefs and prejudices. This has gotten so bad that people seem to exist in completely different realities. What do you instance? One group of people think Trump actually won the 2020 presidential election and it was stolen from him. Um, while another group recognizes the fact that 81 million Americans fucking hate Donald Trump. Um, I can't say enough good about this book, so just buy it. You won't be able to put it down once you get it. So these are some of the books that I use in the research for my videos. As I've said many times, and will continue to say many more times, cash rules everything around me, cream, get the money, Dollar dollar bills, y'all. With that being said, full disclosure, I am a participant in the Amazon Associates program, which is an affiliate advertising program designed to provide a means for the channel to earn fees by linking to Amazon.com. If you use these links listed to purchase these books, that will go towards helping the channel and helping the channel grow. Even if you don't end up wanting to buy the specific book that the link took you to, if you use that link to get to Amazon and then buy a different book or a TV or whatever, just fucking buy stuff, that will count as a commission helping the channel. And I'm broke as fuck. Like, I'm so broke. So I need all the help I can get. The other way you can help the channel is by becoming a patron on Patreon. Like these fine people here, including Alan the Axe of House Axelrod. For as little as $2 a month, just $2, you can get first access to all new content, access to polls, and so much more. That's all for me. Thank you for falling into one of my strange corners of thought, and I'll see you the next time you make a wrong turn. Bye. <laughs>